morning. One thing that didn't make the bulletin by accident there, but you would probably know if you've been around here because it's an annual occurrence, is that next Sunday is our annual uh, Father's Day barbecue, or right after the, the church service we'll join together downstairs for a barbecue. And so uh, each person is asked to bring either a, a dessert or a salad for that, and then all the meat and uh, the, you know burgers and hot dogs and those things are all provided. So plan to stay next week after church for that. Also, that means this is the last week of Christian Ed for... Uh, for this semester. We take a break from that for summertime starting next week when right after the, the worship service, right after the sermon, we have uh, barbecue lunch together. So keep that in mind and please remember, bring either a, a salad or a dessert or both if you would like so that we have lots of that to share and then we'll have uh, hamburgers and hot dogs to share together as well. Also, if you uh, help out with Connection Cafe throughout the year, Mark and Cheryl were asking if you could come early and possibly stay late and kind of be those people that help to set up the downstairs for the, the barbecue and clean up afterwards as well. So anybody that helps with Connection Cafe, so that way it's not all on Mark and Cheryl's uh, shoulders to set up for all of us. So you can come in at you know not around 9.30 or something and, uh, and help set up for that. All right, let's uh, get you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, because that's where we'll get shortly. 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 7. Give everybody a moment to find that. Be our main passage for today, so open it up and keep it open for most of the sermon and follow along through it. 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 7. Let's pray and then we'll get into the second message here on our series of biblical manhood. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to sing songs of praise and worship together in that way and our worshiping together by studying your word. Lord, we thank you for Galilean Bible Camp, for Bill and for the whole team that was here this morning with us. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would bless Galilean, that they would have uh, increased enrollment in coming days and coming years. Lord, that you would provide all the staff that they need, full-time staff and part-time staff and summer staff and, and then many, many children and youth to come through there this summer. Pray for all of the other camps as well, of course, across the north, but we particularly think of Galilean, Lord, and pray that there would be great years ahead of full camps, and uh, Lord, we thank you for all the new initiatives and exciting things going on there at Galilean, and we, uh, we just pray that you would bless them immensely and use them to reach more and more children and youth with the gospel of Christ and disciple more and more uh, children and youth, we pray. So look into the sermon, we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you'd want us to hear and apply this morning, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Troy Aikman was the alpha male of alpha males. He was the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, he won Super Bowls, he dated supermodels, he was tough, fearless, and smart. He was an American warrior, made for football, and he played it with extreme skill. But in one particular moment on January 23rd, 1994, Aikman couldn't remember where he was or why he was there. During the third quarter of the NFC Championship game, Aikman suffered a concussion when a defensive tackle from the San Francisco 49ers brought him down. And his agent, Lee Steinberg, visited him and he answered Aikman's numerous questions about his injury and about the game. And then they celebrated that the Cowboys were Super Bowl bound. Five minutes later, Aikman asked all the same questions, and Steinberg gave all the same answers. Ten minutes later, Aikman asked all the same questions again. Steinberg later said that the exchange terrified him. It terrified him to see how quickly a man's man like Troy Aikman could start to look like a totally confused little child. But in lots of sports, the idea of getting your bell rung and then getting up like nothing ever happened is commonplace because it would appear weak or wimpy to sit out or to admit defeat. And last week, one of the things that was mentioned was that this alpha male, tough guy kind of persona really has very little to do with real manhood, real biblical manhood. A real definition of manhood does not mention sports or weightlifting or hunting or trucks. A real definition mentions character and leadership. And so the definition from Robert Lewis that I proposed to you last week by contrasting Adam and Jesus was that a real man rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, and leads courageously. 
Now today I want to talk about, well, that football kind of warrior culture is not real manhood. It is good to have a kind of warrior instinct. Warrior culture is a bad thing, but warrior instinct is a good thing. Playing sports with a concussion to not appear like a sissy is a bad thing, but being tough is a good thing. Equating manhood with shooting a rifle is a bad thing, but being a soldier in God's army is a good thing. Saying that the stronger you are, the more manly you are is a bad thing, but being strong in God's service is a good thing. Saying that real men should all have physical labor jobs like a farmer is a bad thing. But working really hard like a farmer is a good thing. Let's read 2 Timothy 2 verses 1 to 7. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. In this passage, the Apostle Paul, who used to hate Christians until he became one himself, uses manly metaphors for the Christian life. And while these metaphors should not make us think of warrior culture or a football field or a hockey dressing room or an ultimate fighting octagon, they should make us think about warrior instinct. The definition of warrior instinct that I propose to you today that I read from Jonathan Parnell is this. Warrior instinct is undivided, straightforward, sacrificial focus for good. Undivided, straightforward, sacrificial focus for good. I think it's great that Paul here, the experienced church planter and missionary, is writing to young Timothy, and he gives the example of a soldier, or you could say of a warrior. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse 3 said, Be a warrior for Christ. Take the natural passion for action and accomplishment that all men have and turn that into being a warrior, not just for a football team or an army, but for Jesus Christ by sharing in suffering for Him. And then we also have that example of an athlete and a hard-working farmer. And all these examples speak of undivided, straightforward, sacrificial focus for good. So with that said, in general, in an introduction, let's go back and go through each of these verses one at a time. Although I actually want to start at the last one, verse 7, before we get to verse 1. Verse 7 said, Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. That's what we're going to do here this morning. We're going to think over what we read and we're going to rely on God to give us understanding regarding verses 1 to 6. That's also what I've been doing since I started to prepare this sermon. Thinking over what I'm reading and relying on God to give me understanding. And that is how you should read your Bible every time you read it. 99% of the time, you need to think about what you're reading in order to gain understanding. You can't expect when you read the Bible to just open it up and have everything that God wants you to see appear in your mind's eye as though it was bold and italicized and underlined and just jumping off the page for you. If sometimes that happens, great, praise God, but normally, you got to think about what you're reading and also rely on God to then give you understanding. Pause and think about it. Sometimes you'll have to pause and think longer than other times because it's a little bit more complicated, but most of the time, you just pause and think while you're reading your morning devotions and you'll gain the understanding that you need for that day. Of course, there's complicated passages where you'll have to involve others and ask questions and it takes longer, but each time you read the Bible, don't just read it quickly and close it. Pause, think about what you're reading, pray for understanding, and expect that the Lord will then give you the understanding that you need. So with that said, let's go up to verse 1 and go through this passage. In verse 1, God says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Is it good to be strengthened physically by hitting the gym or doing all sorts of general outdoor activities and sports? Sure it is. 
Definitely. It's, it's certainly good to be strengthened in that way. No doubt about it. But even more important is being strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Being strengthened spiritually. Now what exactly does that mean though, to be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus? Verse 7, just to remind us, we've got to think about what we're reading. Sometimes you might read this on your own and you just kind of skim over verse 1 quickly to get into those metaphors. But what does that actually mean? To day in and day out be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. If we pause and think about it. Well, first of all, the grace that is in Christ Jesus is firstly saving grace. God in His mercy and grace sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Now when a person turns to Christ in repentance and faith, their sin can be forgiven. They can be adopted into God's family as one of His children and given eternal life. It's saving grace that is in Christ Jesus. If you've never experienced that saving grace or trusted in Jesus Christ yourself. I encourage you to do that this morning or talk to me more later about what exactly that means. But Paul's writing to Timothy in this verse. Timothy already has saving grace. He's already a Christian. What does it mean for Timothy, who's already a Christian, to be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus? I believe that what it means is this. Timothy, get your strength today and every day from the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Get your strength to live for Christ by His grace and not by simply your own willpower. When it comes to resisting temptation or living a life sacrificed to God's service, willpower and trying hard will not get you very far for very long. But the grace of God can strengthen you day in and day out and help you to live with undivided, straightforward, sacrificial focus for good. We need God's grace to empower us, not just our own willpower or our own ability to try harder and then try even harder still. We need His grace. I also think that being strengthened by the grace of Jesus includes meaning don't get your strength and your standing before God from yourself and your performance week to week or day to day. Don't get your identity by how, from how good of a week that you've had in living for God or resisting temptation. Always get your strength, get your identity, get your confidence before God from the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Otherwise, your relationship with God will be this ridiculous up and down roller coaster where if you've had a good week, you'll, you'll feel really close to God, but you'll also feel proud because you felt like you did it yourself in your own willpower. Or if you have a bad week, you feel really far away from God and completely condemned. But when you realize that your confidence is in Christ alone, then when you've had a good week, you just give praise to God. When you've had a bad week or you've sinned, you confess and repent of that sin and find forgiveness and move on in grace. So in all of those ways, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Put your trust in God's grace for forgiveness of sin and salvation in the first place, and then gain your confidence before God from His grace, and gain your power to live for God from His grace. Then verse 2 says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This refers to the importance of teaching in general, but specifically in this context, it's speaking about raising up other faithful men who will become elders in the church. And then we read verses 3 and 4 with the warrior metaphor. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. What most specifically is so good about soldiers or warriors here? It's the single-minded, undivided focus. I have a vague memory of the first time that I read this passage in high school and really thought about it. And I was reading it in the 1984 edition of the NIV, which instead of saying, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, it says no soldier gets involved in civilian pursuits. And I remember reading that and asking my dad, does this verse mean that we cannot be involved in anything that is not specifically 100% related to serving Christ and suffering for Christ and sacrificing for Christ? No watching home improvement, no playing solitaire, no vacations, no reading novels, because any of those things, that would be being involved in some sort of civilian pursuit or civilian affair. 
And my dad was able to explain it to me more clearly, but really what would help is a, is a proper translation of that word, which the new edition of the NIV does translate it properly, says entangled rather than involved. And my ESV and almost every other version, it says entangled, because that's the concept there. It's not that you can't be involved in anything else or involved in some sort of hobby in, in its rightful place in small measure. It's that you can't be entangled by those things. Depending on the hobby or depending on how addictive your personality is, perhaps the only way for you not to get entangled in something is to not be involved in it at all. And if that's the case, don't be involved in it at all. But for a lot of hobbies, a little bit of moderate time, relaxing, reading a novel, playing a little bit of solitaire or minesweeper or something, that's not sinful in and of itself. If it just kept in its proper place, it's the entanglement that would be wrong. It's letting a hobby take up too much time or energy that should be spent serving God that is wrong. Remember the definition of warrior instinct. It's undivided, straightforward, sacrificial focus for good. And that's the point of verses 3 and 4. Soldiers or warriors have that kind of focus. And they're focused, it says, on pleasing the one who enlisted him. And for Timothy or for us today, who is it that has enlisted us? It's the Lord Jesus. He's enlisted us and our focus should be on pleasing Him. Even to the point of suffering. These verses mention that soldiers suffer. It's simply a part of the job description. And so it is for those who want to follow Christ. We must be willing to share in suffering. Our suffering in Canada will obviously not be to the same extent or extreme of many Christians around the world who live in countries where they can get thrown in prison for their faith or lose their job for their faith or get beaten for their faith or even killed for their faith. Obviously those things are not going to happen in Canada right now. But nonetheless, we must be willing to suffer in order to please God, the one who enlisted us. Some of our suffering is barely willing... uh, barely really should be called suffering compared to our brothers and sisters around the world that really suffer. But nonetheless, it is suffering in a way when you say no to your flesh that wants to sin or you say no to wasting your time and money and on worldly pursuits and you say yes to a life sacrifice to God of all out service to God. Listen to me here because this is, this is real. Christians, when we get to the end of our lives, we should be able to say There were things I could have done and there were places I could have gone and there were things I could have had but instead I was serving Christ with wholehearted devotion. And so I missed out on some of those things. And if you want to call missing out on some of those things suffering, then go ahead and call it that. I'm not even talking about missing out on sinful things. Just average, normal, everyday things that aren't wrong. But you have to sacrifice something. And if you don't ever sacrifice anything in your Christian life, you should ask yourself, why not? And what's wrong there with that equation? We need to recover this warrior instinct of undivided, straightforward, sacrificial focus for God. And also know this, when you miss out on something, though it feels like suffering in the moment perhaps, you're really not missing out on anything because what is gained is far greater. What is gained by, with the joy of a relationship with Jesus Christ and living all out for Him, what is gained in eternal rewards from living your life for Christ, those things are far greater than what is given up. Continuing on into verse 5, we read, An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. You don't have to be an alpha male, man's man athlete like Troy Aikman or LeBron James to understand the analogy here. Soldiers or warriors have single-minded devotion, and so do athletes. Not only that, but athletes know that there are certain rules in their sports that they need to abide by if they want to succeed. And similarly, in the Christian life, there are certain rules to be followed. And of course, the athlete analogy is so good because, as Warren Worsby and others have put it in various ways, he says, if Christians were putting into their spiritual walk the kind of discipline that athletes put into their chosen sport, the church would be pulsating with revival life. Then verse 6 gives the farmer analogy, saying, It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. There aren't probably very many farmers here, 
but there probably are very many men who work hard. You're a hard-working man. You get up early. You work hard all day. You come home tired out because you're working hard to provide for your wife and your children. And that's great. I wouldn't doubt that there are some men here who in the past or maybe currently balance two different jobs, juggling shifts and are, are very busy and tired out, but they're doing it to provide for their family because it needs to be done. And that is very good to be a hard-working man, working hard kind of like a farmer. But what you need to know is that you should also be a hard worker when it comes to the kingdom of God. Work hard and serve hard. Don't just work for God when it's easy and convenient. Don't just serve God when it's easy and convenient because you've had a a buffer of two nights of TV on either end of the one night that you do something out there in the community or church for God. Don't just do it when it's easy and convenient, but serve hard. Work hard. Have that warrior kind of instinct and mentality that soldiers and warriors have it, athletes have it, hard-working farmers have it. It's undivided, straightforward, sacrificial focus. And what the Church of Jesus Christ needs more of is real men who have undivided, straightforward, sacrificial focus for God. Men who lead their families and lead their church families with undivided focus, straightforward focus, and sacrificial focus. I know it's not easy. We can be distracted by so many different things. We could, we could list many things that easily distract us from focusing on God. We're distracted by our hobbies. Sometimes they entangle us. We're distracted by our TVs. We're distracted by our phones. We're distracted by our computers. We're distracted by sports. We're distracted by social media. And the list could go on and on of all these things that distract us from undivided, straightforward, and sacrificial focus. But we must fight against those distractions. Use a sermon like this. Use a passage like this in 2 Timothy to help yourself to man up, so to speak, by the power of the Holy Spirit to be the man that God's called you to be. And notice that I do say, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because it has to be by His power, finding our strength in the grace of Jesus Christ, and not just by our own willpower, or trying harder, and then trying even harder still. If all we do is try hard in our own strength, then this is like a a pep talk before the third period. And the problem with that is that sometimes a pep talk before the third period helps the hockey team go out there and play better in the third period. But it doesn't really help them the next game, or the next week, or the next year. It's just short-term help. And if all this is is a a pep talk, it's just going to be short-term help as you go out there and try a little bit harder by your own willpower. But if this is a sermon and we're talking about God, and we're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, then the effect can be lasting. Not just short-term trying a little bit harder, but gaining our strength by God's strength and His grace and His Spirit can cause lasting change in your life and mine. I mentioned earlier that verse 2 is most specifically talking about raising up elders in this context when it talks about faithful men. So I'd like you to turn back now with me just a few pages to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2-7. to And we'll read a little passage of what an elder should be. 1 Timothy 3, verses 2-7. to little passage on what an elder should be, which really can extend out to being what what any man should be. So let's read this passage together and see what it says about characteristics of manhood and of being an elder. It says, Therefore an overseer or an elder, an elder must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be thought well of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace and into a snare of the devil." Notice that the characteristics listed here 
are spiritual in nature, not physical in nature. Of course, being a good biblical man sometimes involves some physical things, like holding doors open for others, protecting women and children, doing repairs on your house or on the chapel building here, some physical things. But let us realize that any dedicated Christian fulfilling the job description of 1 Timothy 3 and our main passage in 2 Timothy 2 is more manly than Troy Aikman or LeBron James or even Arnold Schwarzenegger. If a man is more bookish than beastly, it doesn't mean he's any less of a man. If a man likes classical music more than classic cars, it doesn't mean he's any less of a man. If a man looks more like a physical wimp than a physical warrior, it doesn't mean he's any less of a man. If a man likes sewing rather than sports, that doesn't even make him any less of a man. Because those kinds of hobbies do not define manhood. Manhood is defined by character and spirituality. Now, I know some of you are saying, Mark, you're just trying to defend yourself. You know, you're, you're saying, you, you, look more like a, you look more like a bookish wimp than a beastly warrior. I would say, at least I like sports more than sewing. No, I, would, <laughs> I wouldn't even really say that, other than as a joke. Because those things make good jokes, and I love that as much as anybody else. But they're just jokes. Hobbies do not define your manhood. What defines your manhood from last week is rejecting passivity, accepting responsibility, and leading courageously. Or in this case, the, the warrior instinct of the focus you have on doing good, the focus you have on pleasing God and living for God. That's what defines manhood more than hobbies. If a man happens to like sewing more than sports, but he leads his family to come to church with him, he leads his wife to go to small group with him and study together, and they, they read the word together, and he serves God whenever he can, that man is more manly than all the athletes out there that we watch on TV. Hobbies don't define manhood. Character and spirituality defines manhood. And do you know who epitomizes undivided, straightforward, sacrificial focus for good? Jesus Christ does, right? He had undivided, straightforward, sacrificial focus, focused on the cross, focused on making it to Jerusalem there in the last days of his life, in the last weeks. He's our supreme example. And don't be too quick to say, well, we can't follow Jesus' example because Jesus was God. Remember that also, Jesus was fully human. And while he was on earth, he wasn't using his divine attributes all the time. He was acting and living as a human by the power of the Holy Spirit, being empowered by the same Spirit that can empower you and I. Or next to Jesus Christ, maybe think of the Apostle Paul as even a, a more obvious, plain example of someone who's merely a man living by the power of the Holy Spirit. And think of his life of undivided, straightforward, sacrificial focus for good. He worked harder than anyone. He says that, I worked harder than anyone. He suffered immensely. He was stoned to a bloody pulp by an angry mob. He was beaten with rods three times. He had his back mulched by a whip five separate times. He was shipwrecked not once, not twice, not thrice, but four separate occasions on his mission to spread the gospel. And his list of suffering could go on and on. And the Bible tells us to follow his example and follow the other examples of the heroes we read of in the Bible who were just plain normal men but lived by the power of the Holy Spirit, being strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus to live lives of focus for God. So in summary, as we close, warrior culture is a bad thing, but warrior instinct is a good thing. Warrior culture is all about this man's man persona and showing no weakness or humility, but warrior instinct is all about undivided, straightforward, sacrificial focus for good. 
I'm sure that all of you who are women here today could understand, even if I didn't mention it directly, that you too should have this kind of focus on pleasing God. I hope you're here for the month of May when those sermons were more directly uh, directed at women and being a great woman of God and serving God like the women in the scriptures. But I'd like to close now with a a somewhat famous quote from people that know E.M. Bounds about the need for more solid men of God. And I hope you know clearly that also God is looking for solid women of God. But here's the quote. We are constantly on a stretch, if not a strain, to devise new methods, new plans, new organizations to advance the church and secure enlargement and efficiency for the gospel. The trend of the day has been a tendency to lose sight of the man or to sink the man in the plan of the organization. God's plan is to make much of the man far more of him than of anything else. Men are God's method. The church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more and novel methods, but men whom the Holy Spirit can use. Men of prayer, mighty in prayer. The Holy Spirit does not flow through methods, but through men. He does not come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plans, but men. Men of prayer. Let's close in prayer. Lord, I pray that we here who are men would be that kind of men and women the same thing, that kind of women that have this undivided, straightforward, sacrificial focus on pleasing Jesus Christ. Help us to be men of prayer that the Spirit can use, men strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus day in and day out and therefore willing to to live all out, even sharing in suffering for the sake of the gospel. Lord, empower us. May this not just be a, a pep talk or, a, or something before a third period with such short-term effect, but may you really speak to each one here by your word this morning and by your spirit this morning and, and help us, Lord, not just today, not just tomorrow, but next week and next month and for years to come to live with increasingly sharp focus on pleasing you, not being distracted or entangled by all the things around us, but being focused on pleasing you, the one who enlisted us. We pray this in his name, pray it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. We're dismissed to downstairs. Join us for a, a cup of coffee and then Christian Ed classes shortly. Be sure to visit with the Galilean folk at the back and sign up for camp if you haven't already at the back table there.